There is nothing automatic about technological progress bringing these gains. During almost every episode of major technological transitions, what we see is that A, there are many losers from that process, as you pointed out, but even more importantly, B, the phase of widespread gains did not arise by itself or automatically. It was almost always a struggle to get there. It is my pleasure to welcome to the podcast one of my favorite academics, though this is uh, my first time having him on the podcast, the co-author of Power and Progress, Our 1,000-Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity, MIT Economics and Poverty researcher and professor, Darren Esamoglu. Darren, welcome. Thank you, Andrew. It's a true pleasure to be here with you. The pleasure is all mine. Wow, what a book this was. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll go into uh, the I- idea behind it. But I cited you in The War on Normal People about your research on uh, rising deaths of despair and struggles of poverty in America. Um, how did you come to that work? And, and I remember there, I used a quote from you where you were stunned by the findings, which was that American life expectancy was actually going down, not up. Yeah, I mean, I think this is part of a broader trend. Uh, A number of people have noted what a striking reversal this is, because if you look at U.S. data, data for other industrialized nations, even almost all developing countries in the 20th and 21st century, you see this striking increase in life expectancy. And in the United States, in the 2010s, you see a reversal people who really build on that and develop that at great length with a fantastic book is uh, our uh, Angus Deaton and Anne Case, and I draw on their work. And the reason why I think this is so important is because I see it as very closely connected to the overall poverty, inequality, and wage patterns. The other striking thing in the United States, again, pretty much unparalleled anywhere else, is that if you look at low education workers, their real incomes have been declining for about 35 years, pretty strikingly. I mean, again, this is just unseen in any industrialized nation. So let's give someone a very quick capsule bio of yours. You were born in Turkey. Uh, You were an economics professor at MIT. Um, How would you describe your research uh, and the work that you do? Well, you know, I came into economics because I was passionate about understanding democracy and economic prosperity. Little did I know when I first came into economics that, you know, many of these topics were not the ones that economists focused on. You know, when I first arrived (laughs) in the 1990s, you know, we studied markets and supply and demand, but, you know, big questions about democracy and so on were off the table. But as soon as I started exploring these issues, it was quite obvious to me that technological change and innovation were also at the heart of the problem. And so a lot of my research is about what triggers technological progress, big innovation breakthroughs, and what their consequences are, what their inequality implications are, who wins, who loses. And uh, a lot of that was academic work, and then it started being more amenable to public discourse because inequality became a major issue in this country and technological change is around us. And I think debates about what technology is doing to our society are becoming more central. So the Power and Progress book is the culmination of all of this research and thinking. Yeah, so uh, your latest book, Power and Progress, makes an argument uh, that's similar to, frankly, an argument I made when I was running for president in the last cycle. Um, now, now, there's this very, very big fissure uh, or divide one, one has uh, when you think about technological progress and its effect on human prosperity. So the main one is, hey, every time something gets invented, 
we become more prosperous. It's great. And even if it's not you directly, it's going to be one of these rising tide lifts all boats scenarios. So we should all cheerlead for progress. Now, the other side of the coin is, hey, when these technologies get adopted, they kick certain people to the curb. They make certain people richer, certain firms uh, more central and, and powerful. Right now, the main technology people think of, and this is AI, um, and AI is going to benefit a certain number of the very large tech firms uh, and their, their shareholders, presumably. And then there may be lots of workers who are on the outside looking in. So your book makes a very, very important and I will say comprehensive historically documented argument about which of these two we should be looking at. Uh, and you say, look, it's, it doesn't happen on its own. It's actually uh, a result of a lot of social, economic, and political choices. So if you were to sum up for people, does technology mean that we all get richer and more prosperous? Well, your, your, your description and your emphasis are 100% on target. Yes, indeed, this is very coherent, uh, consistent with your emphasis. And the way I put it when discussing this issue is that you have to have two potentially conflicting frames in your mind. One is, no doubt, we are amazingly fortunate to be living today rather than, say, 300 years ago. And that's largely because of industrial technologies and scientific breakthroughs that have then been applied to our lives. So we are beneficiaries of technological progress. We are so much more healthier, so much more comfortable, so much more prosperous, so much more secure than people 300, 250 years ago. But conflicting with that, there is nothing automatic about technological progress bringing these gains. During almost every episode of major technological transitions, what we see is that, A, there are many losers from that process, as you pointed out, but even more importantly, B, the phase of widespread gains did not arise by itself or automatically. It was almost always a struggle to get there. So sometimes when we talk about these issues, and I'm sure you got this a lot, Andrew, as well, you get the question, so you are, are you saying that this time is different because we've always benefited from technology in the past, so you must be saying this time is different. And this book is saying, no, this time is no different. In the past, too, we've had these struggles. We've had many people who've been damaged by technology when it wasn't appropriately used. For example, the Industrial Revolution, to which we owe our prosperity, led to lower incomes, much harsher working conditions, much lower life expectancy for about 100 years for the working people. Yeah, and, and that's what your book painstakingly does, is it goes out through history and says, okay, when there was a great leap forward technologically, uh, did everyone feel the benefits? Exactly. <laughs> and, so, and so you um, you go through major examples, and uh, the answer is a lot of the times people did not feel the benefits, starting with uh, the development of even uh, agriculture and and farming, uh, in Europe, uh, where it turns out that there were some landowners and then a bunch of serfs. <laughs> I mean, you know, and again, you know, how can you expect that things would be so seamless when almost all land, almost all technology, almost all power was so concentrated? And it wasn't. You know, another example, even closer to home, is the cotton gin. The United States became the largest exporter of cotton, and the southern economy was completely revolutionized by the ability to plant uh, cotton that could then be cleaned ma on a massive scale. But who were the producers? Were they were the enslaved black people? Did they benefit? Hell no. Their conditions became much harsher on cotton plantations, longer working hours. They were moved to the uh, further deep south. And of course, again, you don't expect their conditions to improve seamlessly because they were in an enslaved relationship. So power matters. What we're doing with technology matters. AI is so amazing because it's so versatile. So that makes these issues more important, not less. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. 
It's a pretty short list of things you can do that are going to make you happier, healthier, more energetic, more productive every single day. You know what's on that list? Getting the right freaking mattress. And what's the right mattress for you? If you go to Helix Sleep, you take their personalized sleep quiz and they will send you one of 20 unique mattresses made for you and you alone. Well, not you and you alone, like 5% of people. Do the math. For a 100 night free trial, you can sleep on this thing for three months. It will keep you cool. Don't just take my word for it. My kids seek out this mattress in the house. It's the number one rated mattress picked by GQ and Wired Magazine. This mattress will actually make you happier, healthier, and more productive. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com yang. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. We talked about the Industrial Revolution, and the, your book uh, does say there's been one major example of rising prosperity, and that's uh, the U.S. post-World War II, where there were all these gains, but they were broadly felt, um, and, but there was a lot of work that went into that. Absolutely. I think, you know, if we want to be a little bit more historical, the character of growth changes starting in the second half of the 19th century in the UK and perhaps around the same time a little earlier a little later in the United States you have much more emphasis on increasing the productivity of workers and you have somewhat more worker voice for example in the UK trade unions were completely uh, illegal and prosecuted for much of the 19th century. They become legal. Democracy settles in in the United States. There is greater voice for workers. But it's haphazard. You know, Henry Ford, who's a great, amazing leader when it comes to spearheading new technologies that have been foundational for mass production, new tasks for workers, much greater worker productivity and higher wages, but he was very anti-union, for example, and he could get away with it. So the post-war period is unique in the United States and most of the rest of the industrialized world in a couple of ways. First of all, you see this tremendously fast progress in terms of GDP per capita. And it is very, very broadly shared. In fact, from 19, late 1940s to the mid-1970s, inequality declines in the United States and much of the Western world. You see real wages for workers of all education groups r rising in tandem. And this is, again, underpinned by a particular direction of technological tr progress that was very human complementary, augmenting workers, creating new tasks for them. And workers had voice through the democratic process, through labor organizations, and so on. But, of course, you know, that era came to an end. I think we learn as much from understanding how the economy worked during those 30, 35 years as from the process via which it actually started unraveling. From the 1980s onwards, you see much greater inequality, actually slow productivity progress, actually to productivity growth is slower. And you see many dimensions of technological change being much less pro-worker, more automation, more surveillance, less investment in workers. I think that's the ensemble of the economy and politics that we have to understand when we move into the age of AI. No, when, when I was running for president, I was in Iowa, and I met with some UAW uh, workers. UAW had shrunk in there. But they gave me a movie to watch at home. It's called Brothers on the Line. Uh, and it talked about the early days of the UAW. There was a leader named Walter Ruther. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Walter Ruther had multiple assassination attempts uh, in his home. One of his family members get shot. Like, th things that are really beyond the pale. And you're reading this, you're like, oh, my gosh, what the heck? Uh, he, he got beaten multiple times. Uh, and, and reading and watching this, um, it made you realize just what a titanic struggle it was for workers to get certain benefits uh, and there was this rise of organized labor throughout much of the period we're describing, and then it goes into reverse 
uh, starting in the 70s, we're, as we're having this conversation, I want to say only maybe 10 or 11 percent of the U.S. labor force is unionized, and it was uh, over double that level uh, in, let's say, the 60s. Absolutely, 100 percent. And look, you know, I think the U.S. labor history is fraught with problems on both sides. Ruther was actually a very interesting figure because he was one of those who understood that he had to work with companies and he had to create a cooperative environment in which labor had a voice, not just in working conditions and wages, but also in technology. So that was an amazing insight. But most of the business world tried to bash unions and most of the unions didn't really focus attention on where they should have done, which is how we're using technologies. How can we cooperate with managers and businesses so that we get the most out of technology for our workers? You see that actually in some European cases, in Germany, in the Nordic countries, the kind of corporatist model with or uh, workers on, on company boards facilitating this conversation about technology so that workers are part of the beneficiaries and part of the conversation about technologies. And actually, quite frankly, Writers Guild of America is sort of grappling towards that. It's perhaps the first postmodern uh, strike where the issue is AI, who controls creative data, and perhaps can we find a way of using these technologies for the betterment of the workers, in this case writers, perhaps directors, perhaps actors as well. I think those are the sorts of issues that we have to be focusing on and the labor movement should be focusing on. I am pumped to announce that I have a novel coming out on September 12th, The Last Election. It's a political thriller co-written with my friend Stephen Marsh, who wrote the book The Next Civil War. If you listen to this podcast, Stephen's been a repeat guest. Stephen and I became friends and thought we should collaborate on a way to scare the shit out of people, but also entertain them with a story of what could happen in this upcoming election or the election thereafter. Do check it out at andrewyang.com slash books, and there's a special discount code, last election, that you can use for 30% off at the publisher's website. I'll be talking more about this book, but I'm so pumped to get this out into the world. Last election, coming your way. Yeah, the, the actors just joined that strike, uh, and that, that strike's... Uh, I think going to be very, very significant in terms of scope and duration, in part because the studios want to use AI uh, to, let's say, supplement uh, mm -hmm. the talent. Where I mean, that's being kind of euphemistic, obviously. <laughs> they're, they're saying, hey, actor, come in, we'll get your likeness, uh, and then we can actually make use of it uh, with AI, or your voice in particular. I mean, they're very good at audio uh, replication and, and simulation, and uh, not surprisingly, the actors and the writers are, are saying, "Forget that! <laughs> you know, <laughs> we got to get paid for our, our time and our work." So, uh, Walter Ruther was one of the organizers of the uh, March on Washington, where MLK had um, gave the "I Have a Dream" speech. Uh, you know, it, it, he, they were making common cause with the. Uh, civil rights movement at that time, and it made you realize, wow, there was like this very, very robust, unified, popular movement, or as unified as you can imagine, um, that has really been dramatically weakened and changed over the, the succeeding decades. What's happening now with the writers and actors, I think, uh, is very emblematic, but it's also uh, somewhat unusual in American life because uh, only one in 10 um, uh, American workers is part of a union. So one of the things that people will say is um, organized labor is getting stronger uh, because you're seeing Amazon have some unionization efforts uh, uh, and other employers that hadn't had it previously. I will confess that as, as a numbers guy, it's like, look, if you take it from, let's call it 21% of the population to 10%, uh, and then it goes to, to 11%, um, it would be an incredibly dramatic change from where we are now because you would have increased the number of 
you know, a proportion of unionized workers by uh, 10% of what it currently is. Um, but in the, the scope of the economy, and, and uh, you know, it, it strikes me that that might be uh, a very difficult path to recreate. Absolutely. Look, the labor movement is weak, but even worse. I don't think the old model of unions centered on blue collar workers is the right one for the future. So we need to find a new model of worker voice. It has to be perhaps more inclusive in terms of what sectors, what types of skills it covers. And, you know, the future is going to be a lot of white collar work, knowledge work, in person services. The issues are quite different. Amazon workers, Starbucks workers, you know, they're, they're grappling with some of these things. But, you know, when it comes to knowledge work, what sort of worker voice we want, how that work is going to be organized, how we're going to use technologies. Now, this is a unique moment because among the knowledge workers, Writers Guild is the only one that's actually organized. But more importantly, absolutely like you said, the studios are very interested in using AI in order to cut labor costs. But they're not there yet. The current technology, despite all of the hype, the large language models, they cannot do anything approaching the type of creative work that writers, screenwriters can do at the moment. But the future is visible that more of that will be available. So right now, we have the issues quite clear, so we have to negotiate on them. And I think this is kind of a unique moment. If Writers Guild get the right issues on the table, they can build a sort of compact with the employers. I think that can be a model for other sectors. And I think a key problem here, very much along the lines of your emphasis in the past, is, is this technology going to be used for just automation? For example, are we going to use large language models to take a lot of sitcoms and write some cheap not so good versions of Seinfeld or Friends? Or can we use them in a way that is complementary to writers that becomes a tool in their hands for research, for information filtration, for inspiration, but they control their own creative process and their own creative data? I think those two are very different visions. They require different types of investments in the technology, and they also require different type of labor management relations. Hey, YouTube, glad you're enjoying the podcast. If you really like it, hit subscribe, and then YouTube will notify you every time we have a bang-up new guest. Thank you. Yeah, you reference essentially owning your own data or work, uh, and now that data is getting used to train the large language models, uh, and you're not compensated for that. So uh, a lot of writers feel like they're writing their way out of a job because their work's getting used uh, to improve AI. Uh, and a lot of Americans, I dare say, feel that way. Uh, you're right about the writers being one of the only organized white collar groups that could make this fight. Uh, one group that I think of is journalists and 50 or 60,000 journalists lost their jobs over the last 15, 20 years, um, I imagine at least some of them might have been unionized in, in some of these environments, but that there really was no fight. Uh, and you'd look at it and say, well, it's because these local newspapers were dying and there wasn't much of a negotiation going on. Um, but you still do have uh, at least certain media companies that um, are quite profitable, uh, you know, and, and one of them is New York Times. I think there's a unionization effort um, going on over there. Um, so, the, so the writers are somewhat singular. Now, you make a case, and this is one reason why I like both your work and your book, is that you didn't do what some people do. is like, hey, this stuff's going on, and, uh, and um, you know, well, let's hope for the best. <laughs> Instead, you actually make the case and say, okay, here's what you need. Number one, you need a new narrative. Uh, number two, you need a coalition of countervailing interests. And then number three, you need some policies you're going for. Um, so let's start with number one. What is the conventional narrative? And then what do you think the new narrative should be or has to be? Thank you, Andrew. I think that's really, to me, 50% of the fight is that new narrative. 
And that means, first of all, we agree on what are feasible and desirable aspirations. And there, I think, to me, that's quite obvious. We want AI and other new technologies, but especially AI, to go in a pro-human direction, be a tool in the hands of humans from all backgrounds, make them more productive, more informed, better citizens, better workers, not disempower them, empower them. I think we have to agree on this. Again, not everybody would agree with that. Some people may agree on the outside, but in the inside they say, no, wouldn't it be better if we could just eliminate these workers? And some people will say that's not feasible. Then we get into some technical discussions. That's why, you know, in the book we go back to the sort of competing visions of what machines and what digital technologies are about. Are they going to be inevitable, autonomous, machine-intelligent type of uh, objects? Or could they be tools for humans, machines that are useful to humans? I think those two visions are going to be central to it. And then once we agree on this, aspiration, I think the narrative is about whether if there is something good, technology will naturally go to it, sort of the techno-optimist view, or whether we can entrust it to some techno-geniuses, be it Sam Altman today, or whether it was Bill Gates in the past. So sort of great people, obviously very creative, but can we entrust them? Because they're going to follow their own vision, they're going to follow their own interests, and if we just entrust them in, you know, if we trust them too much, if we empower them too much, then alternative voices are going to be drowned. So the narrative is about what we want and how society can have a voice in it via the competitive process, new firms entering, but also through sort of deliberation, the democratic process, the media, civil society organizations, podcasts, people sort of expressing their concerns, their views, their alternative paths towards it. You talk about, look... There's a handful of technologists uh, that kind of dominate the discourse, uh, and they naturally will not be making this more human-centered case. So let's say that you have a human-centered case, and you say we should be at the center of the set of innovation, and we shouldn't expect this just to magically happen, which, by the way, I see all the time <laughs> out there. I'm sure you do, too. It's like, oh, don't worry, you know. Magical stuff, invisible hand. Uh, I was like, look, the, the invisible hands is gonna gonna scrub out a lot of people yeah. <laughs> on, 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 on this one. The invisible hand, and if you question it, you're a luddite. Yes. Yeah. No. It, I mean, hey, take it from the MIT economics professor. The, you know, you <laughs> might need you might need to do a little more. Uh, so then, then you have this uh, coalition of interests who come together, and I guess you cited many of them just now. Um, uh, where you, you talk about various interest groups, um, which at this point should be <laughs> most of us, since I think most of us realize that we're somewhat subject to this. Um, and, and then clear policy goals. Uh, and you make cases for some pretty big policy investments, uh, including strengthening the, the social safety net in the U.S. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, I think... The narrative has to change. You need this to be embedded in an institutional grounding, countervailing powers, you know, better working democracy. But at the end of the day, technology is not going to take care of itself unless you want to just follow the same path. So you need some sort of inducements for different types of new technologies to emerge and the current equilibrium to be modified. So for that, we need policies. We need the right policies. Nobody knows what these policies are. And there's a very good reason for that, because we haven't been experimenting with them. Everybody says, oh, well, you know, I accept now that we need some AI regulation, but we don't know what AI regulation should look like because we have completely abrogated our responsibility to, to regulate digital technologies for at least the last two, two, two decades, probably more. So those policies have to be viewed as ideas that need to be explored more. But again, the... Objectives are very clear. This country has reached a level of inequality and poverty that's really unacceptable in the 21st century with such great abundance that exists around us. So we have to strengthen the social safety net, absolutely. But there, I also think it's not just a social safety net because I don't think a society in which earned income is very, very unequal and then we just 
create a somewhat more equal distribution by taxes and transfers would be a happy one. It would create a huge status inequality. It would be always subject to inequality again exploding even more and the political equilibrium being captured by the people who have the income. And quite honestly, I actually think we can do better because if we can use AI in a more pro-human, pro-worker direction, I think we can create the kinds of good jobs that were the you know, mainstay of the middle class existence that the United States was so good at for most of the 20, uh, most of this, uh, the post-war era. Some things we do in public, some things we do in private. And we certainly would like to be able to know that when we're alone, we're actually getting our privacy. Online is the same thing. Your online privacy is just as important as in the real world. That's why I use ExpressVPN when I'm online because I don't want my internet service provider to know every website I visit, nor do I want them to sell my data to big tech companies. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted connection, a tunnel between your device and the internet. No one can see it. It works on any device. All you have to do is fire up the ExpressVPN app, click one button, it's as easy as that. I recommend this. Fortune 500 companies use ExpressVPN for good reason. And you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN free by going to expressvpn.com slash yang. That's expressvpn.com slash yang for three extra months free. Expressvpn.com slash yang. So what has your experience been since you've written this book, uh, Come Out? Um, you and Simon Johnson, your collaborator, are, are both... Uh, really, really admired and respected in your field. Uh, you've written best-selling books uh, before this. So uh, are, how are people taking to this case you're making? Well, look, I think so far I see three sets of responses, which is sort of inevitable, I think, for any book like this. I think we've had very, very good reception from Europe, the UK. Uh, market has been very active with newspapers, policymakers being very interested. And in the United States, the same sort of interest from policymakers and intellectual groups, I think uh, that's, been, that's been great. So the conversation, when we have been part of it on these topics, has been really uplifting because it shows there are lots of new ideas. There is energy, there is concern, there is positive concern, not the sort of that says, oh, you know, uh, killer robots are coming, we should just hide under our mattresses. No, we can do something about this. So, so that's, the, that's the positive side. The second, you know, it's also inevitable, is some, sometimes silence. People just ignore it. I think I would love this book to be more part of the conversation in the tech world, because I think the nexus of many of these changes is going to be the tech world. There are so many people working in the tech industry who are very concerned, who recognize that the machinery that they are part of is not always functioning for the social good, but they don't know, they can't always identify what the root cause of these problems are and what they can do. I think they need to be part of this conversation. So I think your uh, sort of voice here is really important to sort of bring these sorts of issues even more to the attention of the tech world. And then, of course, there has been some, you know, uh, hostile reactions. Uh, I think some people read the book as a very interventionist book. So some free market outlets such as the Wall Street Journal have not been very receptive to it. But I think at the end of the day, yes, of course, we do make some bold policy uh, proposals. But I think we are making them in the spirit of saving the market system. Because the current... Yeah, I, I, I made the are, same argument, for sure. Right, you know, fun, market <laughs> fundamentalism is actually its worst enemy. Yeah. Uh, so, so I really don't see the book as a partisan one. And I think exactly like in the spirit that you are presenting your ideas as well. These are not partisan ideas. I would love it if Republicans picked up on some of these ideas. Markets don't function very well if you don't have a middle class. <laughs> People don't, don't, don't have the ability to participate. You don't regulate them. I mean, I think we learned, we learned a wrong, long, wrong lesson from the success of 
the U.S. and other European economies relative to the Soviet Union, the euphoric feeling after the fall of the Berlin Wall was, oh yeah, the end of history, you know, capitalism is triumphant and the alternatives are obliterated. Yes, to some degree, the U.S. European system was victorious, but that's because it was a regulated market system. And then by dismantling these regulations at that breakneck speed, we've actually made it much harder for that market system. Well, it's very hard to argue with your book, in my opinion, because you backed it up with literally hundreds of years of data and history. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you went, went, went through all these major technological shifts. I mean, the the canal story is crazy. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, for, if, for those of you who uh, want to dig into it, um, the, there's a story early in the book about how uh, there was a point when canals were the brand new technology, and let's just say it didn't go well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's such an interesting story because it epitomizes some things that we can see with our own eyes today. Techno-optimism, people thinking, oh, you know, these problems are going to solve themselves, and if we hit roadblocks, new technologies will come to solve them. Hubris, you know, the, the, the sort of... The main character, the protagonist of that story is Ferdinand de Lesseps, who had a very powerful vision of techno-optimism and opening markets. And he was very successful in Suez against the odds and against the views of many establishment people. And that meant that he became both himself hubristic and then the whole sort of surrounding environment became completely beholden to him, which made him walk into a complete disaster in Panama Technologies that could not work, no attention to details, 22,000 people dead uh, because of bad planning. So we hope that we learn from those sorts of historical episodes. You know, I, I say that's a fitting note to end on, <laughs> Darren. Let's not be the 22,000 canal workers who just expect it to work out. Power and progress, our 1,000-year struggle over technology and prosperity, a very smart, learned man who's trying to help humanity, Darren Asimoglu. Darren, if someone wants to keep up with you, how can they best do so? Uh, I have a Twitter account, also email at daron at mit.edu. I would love to hear feedback and uh, other uh, information. Thank you. I can attest that that email works because that's how I got a hold of Darren. Darren, thank you. Keep up the awesome work, my friend. Thank you, Andrew. It was a really true pleasure and privilege to be on your podcast. Wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm.